There is a running joke in my house with Paul that has its roots in the old I Love Lucy TV show. Lucy would come home from shopping and tell Ricky how much money she has saved him today. So when I go home with a shopping bag in tow, Paul always asks me, how much money did you have to spend to save me today? Earlier this week, I did some retail shopping therapy as I took my 30% off coupon at the Kohl's uh, department store and I purchased a few new shirts and some pants. And as I was placing them on the counter, the person at the register asked me if I had found everything that I was looking for. And my first response was, yes! but I had to stop before I went broke saving money. By using my Char uh, Kohl's charge card to pay with, I received an extra bonus of $40 in Kohl's cash. What a great deal! I saved on uh, buying stuff that was already marked down, plus 30% off of my coupon, and I gained $40 in Kohl's cash. Paul, guess how much money I saved you today? And I received on top of that $40 of Kohl's cash. Now, the only place that Kohl's cash is good to spend is, of course, at a Kohl's store. Our little running joke about how much I have saved today is based on sarcasm. Much like what was happening between Jesus and the envoy sent by the Herodians and the Pharisees. Those who went to ask Jesus his opinion as to the lawfulness of paying taxes to Caesar uh, was not done for information, but rather to entrap Jesus. If Jesus were to say it is unlawful to pay taxes to Caesar, he would be accused of sedition and arrested for advocating revolutionary ideas against Rome. If he said it is lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, then he would lose face among the followers who, in general, were opposed to being ruled by Rome. This conundrum goes beyond the idea of civic responsibility, which would be a very convenient resolution for us. For if it were that simple of an answer as to paying taxes to Uncle Sam because it's the law and giving money to the church, which is representative to God, it would be an easy easily handled by writing out checks to both and then to go on our merry tasks. No, it is not that easy for us to brush off this encounter that we are reading. For in Jesus' answer to the delegation standing before him, Jesus exposes the hypocrisy that they often try to hide behind. We, by paying monies to both the government and to the church, we can say that we are fulfilling a requirement made by both entities. But that is false rationalization being made by us. So what is going on in this story? In actuality, the Pharisees were theologically and politically opposed to the Herodians. <clears throat> the Pharisees saw an immorality in using coins with the image of Caesar stamped on them and resented being ruled by a foreign power. The Herodians, on the other hand, which were the social elites of Israel and Judah, they were supporters of the puppet king Herod, who was placed into power by Rome. 
Yet these two enemies found a common need to get rid of Jesus. In this story, they had joined forces hoping to entrap Jesus in a situation that would lead to his ruin. The Pharisees were hoping to get rid of a person who challenged their institutionalized indifferences towards the poor and the disenfranchised. The Herodians were wanting to have Jesus out of the way in order to overt a potential rebellious situation which would potentially shift the balance of power that they had come to enjoy as subjects of Rome. Both groups were afraid of losing their political influence, their local power, and their personal wealth. You can think of the Pharisees and the Herodians as those who benefit through the concept of white privilege that we deal with today. In Jesus answering or asking for a coin from this group, he is able to use the coin in a way of exposing their hypocrisy. Whose face is on the coin? asks Jesus. And then he goes a step further and asks what is inscribed on it. The reply is honest. Caesar is the figure on the coin. Flips it over, and on the other side of the coin is the inscription ascribes, inscribing divinity to Caesar. You see, Caesar was not just the ruler of Rome, but as emperor was also viewed as a god. He was the descendant of Ares and Aphrodite, making him a son of the gods. To the Romans, Caesar was the Prince of Peace, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. And these are ex the exact attributes that the Hebrews in their book of Isaiah were giving to their Messiah, their Savior. So you can see how the Hebrews were very uneasy about paying taxes to Caesar in Roman coinage. And by doing this, they were not just paying taxes, but in essence, providing an acknowledgement, an affirmation of Caesar's proclaimed divinity. In the eyes of the average Hebrew, when they were paying taxes, it implied the breaking of the first two commandments. You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make graven images of me. When Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, he was defining the limitation that Caesar had. When Jesus says, and give to God what belongs to God, Jesus has defined for the Hebrew who has the most power. For it is God who is the creator of all, and Caesar only has his power through God's permission, thus making Caesar subject to God. This part of Jesus' answer brings then this question. What is God's currency? And why does God have ultimate power even over an emperor? If we ascribe to the belief that God is the creator of all, we then recognize that we are made in the image of God. This is something to keep in mind when we are paying our taxes or contributing to the work of the church. Taxes are a requirement by legislation. When we talk about giving monies, time, 
our talents to the church, we speak in terms of gifting. If we think of our giving to God as a requirement, that leaves room for resentment. I'm required to give to God. I don't really like that. Just like we say, I'm required to pay taxes. I really don't like that. We have no laws like that in this country of paying uh, to the church. But if we live life with the realization that we are a living image of our creator, of God, that it is this God who has made all things possible within our life, then what we are giving to God is an acknowledgement of such gift. Our giving then comes from our heart as a thank you or as a I want to help in this way to provide what you are trying to do. <clears throat> so what is the currency of God? What is God's economy based upon? The answer is found just a little bit further down in this chapter of Matthew, when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds this way. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. For the Hebrew, for the Muslim, for the Christian, the question is what is truly lawful isn't about who we pay our taxes to, but rather how we treat each other and who we place at the center of our hearts. Jesus says you cannot serve two masters as you will hate the one and love the other. Where is your treasure? We have a choice to either put other gods before us and work to satisfy their needs, or we can place God before us and serve God's needs through love, mercy, and graciousness. So the question no longer will be cash or credit, but rather love with all of your heart, mind, and soul or I'll pay cash. Amen.